welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis, and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. What can we learn from their journeys as we explore some of the key issues around equality in sport and beyond? Before I introduce my guest today, I'd like to say a really big thank you to our partners, Sport England, who support The Game Changers through a National Lottery Award. Today, I'm talking to an extraordinary woman who has many talents, including being a multilingual TV sports presenter. Orla Shinui is now a lead presenter for Eurosport, working across cycling, MotoGP and the Olympics. Her background in hard news and investigations means that Orla always has an open and frank approach to sports reporting, whether that's in front of the camera or hosting podcasts and writing regular columns for Ruler magazine and the Metro newspaper. Amongst her many accolades, Aura has also just been nominated as Sports Presenter of the Year at the Sports Journalist Awards 2022, so congratulations there. Aura, when people think of you, they may think of you broadcasting, writing, podcasting and your love of cycling in the Olympics, but they may not think of you as a uh, champion athlete, but you are. So can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that too? Certainly, Sue. Thank you so much for that introduction. I feel completely humbled. I should say, I don't think anybody ever thinks of me. I'm certainly not as any kind of an athlete, never mind a champion athlete. I used to be a track and field athlete as a kid. It was such a huge part of my life growing up and And I think only now that I'm considerably older, I realise how formative it's been in my character, my strength and my discipline, I think. But yeah, I was track and field as a kid and a triple jumper randomly. And every time I say it, people's eyes sort of pop out of their head because I think it's maybe one of the most random disciplines to do. But um, yeah, I was twice All-Ireland champion in triple jump. And that's as great as my athletics career ever got. And I dreamt for years of competing at the Olympic Games and representing Ireland at the Olympic Games. And it never happened, but um, it has led me into this beautiful career that's been actually considerably more rewarding. So I'm very grateful for that. But um, my athletic days are long behind me, (laughs) Sue. And did you come from a very sport-loving family too? I did. I did. Sport was a massive part of where I grew up, really. It's a massive part of our culture. I grew up in Northern Ireland, in rural Northern Ireland, and in a very Irish community, a very Catholic community. Um, And so Gaelic sports were the heartbeat, really, of our entire village and our entire network of villages. And it was my mum, and still is my mum in particular. My dad is a huge um, Gaelic fan as well, but my mum in particular um, is obsessed with Gaelic football. And so we we would spend Sundays, any Sunday we could, would be following, especially Derry around the place and in in all of their um, progress through the All-Ireland as a family, we'd pack into the car and we'd take our um, our flask and our sandwiches wrapped in tin foil, and we'd get to the football match and open the boot and sit in the boot and, and eat our sandwiches and drink our tea before we went into the match with our flags and dressed in red and white because that's the colour of dairy. So sport was a massive part of our family life. My siblings all played sport to, to varying degrees. But yeah, I think for me, because of that community element of it and because it was such a connection between all of our villages. You know, I, I wasn't just from one village. I was from a network of villages that played against each other. So it's always been a really important bond of, of community and connection for me, sport. And I think that's where that comes from, just from my childhood experience of it. And you studied law and French at university. And I have to point out, I think you speak, is it six or seven languages? Oh. <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm really... I'm not being falsely humble. I dabble in languages, but if you were to put me on the spot with anyone, I'd need a little second. So I speak fluent French because my husband is French Moroccan. I speak Dutch now because I live in the Netherlands. I've gotten my German to a level where I've been able to broadcast in it. And I've done like live red carpet interviews in, in Portuguese and Italian. I could brush up on Spanish if I needed to. I can't remember any others, but I try, I just, I enjoy communicating. See, that's the thing. And so I don't care if I get language and grammar and syntax wrong, but I, yeah, I like learning languages. I find it just very satisfying. It's fun, isn't it? I like having little secrets as well. I like, I like communicating with people in secret and other people don't know what you're talking about. It's sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's especially impressive. I, I'm a 55 year old woman who just started speaking or learning Spanish on Duolingo oh, last week, actually with my daughter. So I'm coming to it late. But <laughs> It's never too late though, is it? It never is. Duolingo is no, a great no. tool. I really enjoy it. I do that sometimes just for fun. If I've, if I've got time to yeah. kill, I'll just go and Duolingo and pick a language, which is incredibly sad <laughs> of me, but that's how I feel my like third time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
that's very good fun. And was law ever a serious consideration as a career path for you? It sounds awful to say it was a bit of a backup. It was a bit of a safety net, really. My dad wanted me to study law and I just thought, well, that's a good profession to have. I always did really want to be a journalist, um, but there were journalists that I admired who had studied law. And so I thought, well, maybe that's a good way into it. I didn't really know why. I know now why when I when I look back at the grounding that law gave me and the anal analytical ability that it gave me. But I also wanted to live in France for a year because I thought that'd be really cool. And if you studied law <laughs> with French, then you got to go to French university. If you studied French with something else, then you had to go and teach in a French school. And I didn't want to teach in a school. I wanted to be wholly irresponsible. So I thought, well, if I study law in French in France, then I can just do my own thing. So that was part of the reason as well, which is terrible for four years of study. But um, I do love a good argument, Sue, and that's why I thought law would be good for me. I love a good debate. I love getting my head into um, proper discussions. And I thought a law degree would be a good way to win a few arguments. It hasn't really been, but um, that was my my entire thinking on it. And did you go straight from there, from law then to postgraduate in journalism? Was that like a natural progression? Yeah, I went straight in. Yeah, I didn't do any of these gap years or whatever. I went straight into a postgrad in journalism and then, then that was it. And then knew I would fall in love with that um, industry and that craft and that trade. And I did and haven't regretted it once. And you work both in print and then broadcast journalism and you literally went up and down the United Kingdom from Scotland to Southampton. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what eventually took you to, to Sky News? Oh, uh, the opportunity to work at Sky News is what took me there, really. As you say, I sort of travelled around an awful lot. I did my postgrad in Edinburgh and then uh, myself and my now husband moved down to Berkshire. He had a, a placement year there. So I worked in radio down there. Then I worked in television in Southampton. And then I moved back up to Edinburgh and worked in television there. And um, I just saw the job advertised for Ireland correspondent at Sky News. And I was just about to get married. And we lived in Edinburgh. And, and the job meant moving to Belfast. And so I applied for it thinking I wouldn't get it in a million years. And I didn't want to think about getting it because obviously it would be not the most conventional start, shall we say, to married life, to leave your husband within two months. But I did get it. And that is what I did. <laughs> but it was really just, yeah, it was the opportunity to work at Sky News, really. It was an honour. And, and I knew it would be incredible grounding and, and the best that there is, really. And, and where did the switch come then into the sports journalism side? Well, as I say, I always wanted to be a journalist. And I actually never thought about being a sports journalist, even with all my sporting background. I just never considered it. I wanted to be a war correspondent. That was my dream. I wanted to be Kate Eady and latterly Orla Geeran. That was a path I was trying to go down. And news, it's brutal. It's, a, it's really, really, really difficult. And not just the environment, but the stories that you're dealing with. You can shut yourself off to the tragedy of humanity for a long time, and you have to if you're a news journalist. And then it just felt a little bit too much for me, really. And I wanted something that was a bit more uplifting. And so the um, London Olympics came along and my boss at the time, Simon Cole, had gone to Beijing for the Olympic Games and just fell in love with everything to do with the Olympic Games and decided that we needed an Olympics correspondent at Sky News. And so I thought, well, that's right up my street. It's got the sport, but it's also got the politics and the finance and um, it was much more than just a sports job. So I went for that and luckily got it. And then that was it. I started to do much more sport alongside the, the politics and the finance. And after the Olympic Games, I just decided there, there's no way I'm going back to news. I'm going to work in sports somehow or other. And, and that's what I did. I just absolutely fell in love with everything to do with it, really. Uh, and what was it like at Sky Sports then for a young female broadcaster, especially as you arrived around the time of this kind of sexism scandal with Richard Keyes and Andy Gray? How was that experience for you at that time? Do you know what? Sky Sports and Sky Sports News, where I primarily worked, I think it's had quite a bad rep over the years. And I think the women are undervalued by the public sometimes because there's a glamour to it and there's a look to it. And I, and I have never felt more supported than I did at Sky Sports News. I was entirely given every single tool I needed to do proper sports journalism. And I was always championed by my boss. My gender in that newsroom was never an issue. Andy Cairns, who ran Sky Sports News at the time, and Barney Francis, who came in at the time of that scandal and sort of sweep, swept it all clean to a certain extent. 
they were both just amazing champions of equality and everybody's got a different experience. So I can't speak for anybody else. But for me personally, I had every opportunity that I felt I deserved in there. And it was a fantastic environment to work in for me. It was absolutely fantastic. And I, and I wouldn't have a single bad word to say about Sky Sports and Sky Sports News. I thought they were fantastically supportive and continue to be so. And I, and I do wish sometimes that the wider audience and maybe fellow journalists would, would look at the women on television in particular, you know, on screen in there and give them the respect that they deserve because they are excellent at what they do. Fantastic. And fantastic to hear you, you know, be so clear about that too. Sky Sports has been a fantastic supporter of us mm, and the Women's Sport mm. Collective and all we're doing. So I think I, I perhaps had some of those perceptions myself historically. And as I've got to know them more and see more of their doing, I uh, yeah, definitely changed my views even in the last year or so. Yeah. And I- and I have to say, even so, since I've left Sky Sports News, even it is the it is my my female colleagues who've been in touch to support primarily the guys as well, and they're fantastic. The guys are all brilliant, but I always felt a sense of sisterhood in there and and a connection with the other women, and and they've proven that by being so supportive of me in different things. And you mentioned that I that I was nominated for Sports Presenter of the Year, and and the number of messages I got from girlfriends in there was just brilliant and genuine and heartfelt and and what women should be for each other I think in this industry so I'm glad you've had that experience as well. Um, I've spoken to other female sports broadcasters on the podcast like Gabby Logan and Ellie Aldroyd and Laura Woods Mm -hmm. who talk about having to work harder than their male colleagues to prove themselves Mm -hmm. is that something you found through sport? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I say how, how wonderfully supportive the newsroom was, but the wider world isn't like that, <laughs> you know. Um, and I I work primarily in cycling. And cycling has changed a lot, uh, even in the time that I've been in it, but it is a very traditional male white European sport still. And when I started in cycling in particular, it was very challenging to be taken seriously and partly because I didn't want to change who I am to be able to fit in and I would turn up to bike races in dresses and wedged heels while everybody else was in pedal pushers and polo shirts you know and obviously all the guys are in jeans and polo shirts I didn't want to stand out that's not why I was doing it but I wanted to be me but obviously then it meant that um I say obviously it shouldn't be obvious at all, but it did mean that that people questioned my presence and my credibility and and why I was there. You know, people would say, "Well, why are you into cycling?" And there's this assumption that you're there because you're trying to get a man, you know, or you whatever it might be. But I remember one of the team bosses who I have an awful lot of affection and respect for, and he said this in, in a really respectful way at the time. But I was standing outside the team buses at the Giro d'Italia, the Tour of Italy, and we were in the mountains. And it was a beautiful sunny day. And I was there again in a short dress and wedge heels. And and he came laughing over to me. And all the guys were standing around waiting for an interview with him. And he just made a beeline for me. He came straight to me and laughed. And he said, oh, Orla, you're, you look like you're going to a party. Um, and I laughed back and I said, I always dress like I'm going to a party because you never know when there's going to be one. And he laughed and he gave me the interview of everybody else, you know. So in the end... I've broken through and I know I've broken through and I'm not going to pretend that I don't know that. Um, but I, it, it's been harder work. And, and I've said before, I'm grateful really for having to work harder because it has made me better at what I do. And even now I know there is no room for complacency. I just can't get things wrong. I just can't be good enough. And I, and I can't be as good as the men. I always have to be better. And you mentioned, I guess, wearing dresses and so on to events, and you do get attention for what you wear on screen. So how important has it been you for, to you to be more distinctive about your appearance? I don't know if it's important to be distinctive to me. It's important to be genuine and to be authentic. And when I started on Eurosport in particular, it is the home of cycling, and it is it has been in the past at least very traditional and so wearing different clothes and funky hair and makeup was a big deal, you know, and I got an awful lot of negative attention and, and mainly people saying, why though? Why are you bothering? Why are you doing that? Um, and Eurosport have always just been entirely supportive because they know I'm good at my job. But it matters to me because I am a woman in sport and I've always wanted to 
see a version of me in sport to know that I belong. You know, I say how much I grew up with sport, but I grew up with it knowing I what I it wasn't really my domain. I was just carving a little place for myself in it. But I would watch television coverage of football and it was always the men talking. And so you feel like you are an invited guest in that rather than someone who necessarily belongs. And so for me, I just want to be a representation of a different kind of sports fan, you know, and I want to show women in particular that you can care about how you look and you can love sport and you can get sweaty and grimy and dirty and still want to put on some lipstick, you know, and it's not this exclusive domain. It's not it's not something that's either frivolous or too serious, you know, and and I feel like whenever I became a mother, um, I had I think a lot of new mums in particular have a bit of an identity crisis. And I had a massive identity crisis, which is linked in with um, postnatal depression and all sorts. And I didn't know if I'd ever be me again. You know, I felt like all of a sudden you, I went from being Orla to as it was then Eve's mum. So I'm Eve's mum. I don't have my own name anymore. And finding my sense of style again as a mum was a really important part of that. And I, and I have found that with other mums, actually, that, you know, you're wearing pregnancy clothes for such a long time. And then afterwards, you're like, well, what's the fashion now? How do I dress? And so for all of those reasons, you know, I want to show mums, you can dress how you like, you know, mums in your 40s, dress how you like, dress like you're 20, because who cares? You know, I love that. I love that. And you talk about that women being stylish on screen and we think about Gabby Logan, Denise Lewis, Alex Scott. So I think that is changing mm-hmm. when you think about the women that we're now seeing presenting sport. Massively. And I fi- and I find that really powerful, you know, and I love Alex Scott in particular, her her Insta feed. I love that. And I'm so glad that she now exists and she's now doing that because it legitimizes it. And and I think now we don't get so much of the shock and horror at dressing how you like and being sassy as well as being intelligent. Because, you know, I do remember one boss saying to me once, you know, we don't show knees and in particular, not you. You're supposed to be the serious one. You're supposed to give us credibility. And I laughed at the time and I wish I hadn't laughed. I kept wearing short skirts, but I I should have said I can be credible and wear short skirts. It doesn't detract from my intelligence. If, If you've got an issue with that, that's your issue. It's not mine. You know, I still have my law degree. I still speak several languages. I've still I've still proven myself in sport over and over again. And if I t- choose to have all of that in my armory and wear a short skirt and heels, then that's for me. So, yeah, I do think it matters. Very powerful. Very powerful. I'm glad I put those questions in. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> you moved to Amsterdam for your husband's job, I believe, a few years ago. And, and yep. I know you've become a cyclist too. I love watching you with Laura Kenny, your first ride at the Velodrome, because <laughs> I did it myself a few years ago. And your video perfectly summed up how terrifying it is. So how was it for you? And have you done it again since then? No, I haven't done it again, actually, but I would love to. I was absolutely terrified. And here's the thing, right? I had an awful day that day and I'd had a late night the night before and I was developing these allergies and sometimes my face swells up. Well, I woke up that morning, Sue, with a face like a balloon, like somebody had stuck a pump in my mouth and and just pumped my face up. And so I was I was traumatized. I didn't know what was going on. I looked like elephant woman. So anyway, but but Laura had offered to give me a track session and I thought well I know this is going to be on camera like I look like I've been to a plastic surgeon you know because my lips were massive and my face was massive but I thought but I can't I, I can't let my vanity and ego at the fact I look weird detract from the fact that Laura Kenny is going to teach me how to ride a track bike so I was like oh I've got to go and do it and I'm so glad I did it and I knew it would be such a privilege to have someone like her the very first time I went on the track and she found it hilarious, of course, because she's so used to it and she's so badass and she's so brave. And there's me, like, I've never ridden a bike without brakes before, you know, and I've never, I've never done it on a track, which is just terrifying. And so I had had, um, my friend and co-presenter Adam Blythe helping me and he was holding up the saddle for me so that I wouldn't wobble over before I even started. And I started going around the track and I was just screaming for most of the time and terrified. And then and then I remember at one stage she was trying to get me to go higher up the banking and I started to do it. 
And as I was screaming in terror, I suddenly realized how exhilarating it was. And the scream turned to absolute joy. And I thought, oh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And I walked back and I was maybe two centimeters above the line. But I thought I was on top of the world. And you know what? It, what was wonderful about it was it, it, is it gave me that feeling again of conquering fears. And that's why I love doing sports and doing new sports or doing old sports in different ways. Because you take on some sort of fear and you have to leave your ego aside because you're not going to be very good at it. You're not going to be able to do it, but you're going to give it a go. And I had such fun that afternoon and I'm so glad I did it. Did it. And I would do it again, um, but I haven't yet. <laughs> so it's easy to say I would do it again, but I'll, I'll just I'll just say it's because I'm too busy. Maybe but it was we'll do it together it at some point in the future. We'll give it another oh, go. Oh, let's do that. See, and we can scream together. You probably won't scream. You'd be much braver than me. <laughs> I did scream. Uh, going back to your move to the Netherlands, how how was that transition? Did you have any concerns about your your career at the time in terms of being in a, a different city? Massive concerns, of course, because I didn't know anybody in the Netherlands. And I was losing and leaving behind my entire network of professional and personal contacts. I lived in London for, uh, goodness, 12 years or something. Um, and, you know, London is still the center of, of media, sports media. But at the same time, I was ready for change and I wanted to spread my wings and I wanted to do more of my own thing. So I was pregnant at the time with my second child. And so I took an early maternity leave from Sky, knowing that was my safety net and knowing that if it didn't work out, I'd find a way to go back again because my job was still open for me. And in the end, I loved the life here so much. I loved the lifestyle in the community and the sense of peace it gives me to live in Amsterdam. I love it so deeply that everything else just works out. It is much harder than if I lived in the UK in terms of work because I still have to travel to the UK an awful lot for my work. And that means leaving my young kids. And that's really difficult for them and for my daughter in particular. But it's all about balance. And you have to decide what you're going to sacrifice in return for what you get. And the life that we have here and the community that we've, that we've become a part of here makes it all worth it. And, and it also makes me enjoy my work so much it's literally a holiday every time I go away for work now because I get to leave all the responsibility at home and just go and have fun chatting about sport it's going to be a massive summer for women's cycling with the second Paris-Roubaix Femme and the Tour de France Femme too so how important is it that young women and men can finally see female role models on bikes in the biggest global races it's just crucial. It's so belated and it makes me sad at the same time as excited that it's taken such a long time and that we're still so far off it, it being equality and parity. But it is so important. And I feel that for myself, but I see it through my daughter. I've had the opportunity in the last couple of years of sitting down with her and her two little friends and watching women's bike racing together. And I cannot tell you how full that makes my heart because each one of them every time chooses somebody different that they're going to support. And so, for example, Anna van der Breche, who was the world champion, and so she wears a jersey with the rainbow bands on it. And so my daughter's little friend, Mahalouise, had chose Anna van der Breche as her rider because she likes unicorns. And she thought, well, she's got a unicorn jersey on. Then we had um, her little friend, Saren, who uh, supported Mariana Voss because Voss rides for Jumbo Visma. And Jumbo is a supermarket in the Netherlands and it's Saren's favorite supermarket. So she wanted <laughs> to support Jumbo Visma. And then Eve was supporting Lizzie Dignan because Eve was born in London. So she sees herself as being English and Lizzie is English. And I've talked to her a lot about the things that Lizzie has done. And so each one of those was cheering their own rider in the race and it was beautiful and then the next week we sat down to watch a men's race and my daughter said oh is the women's race coming next then and there was no women's race coming next and she couldn't understand why there wasn't and when I tried to explain to my daughter why there's still inequality it makes it real and it makes the injustice of it so much more stark because we accept this don't we we accept it like we should but when you tell a seven-year-old yeah but the world's not fair and women still don't have the same opportunities as men. They literally cannot get their heads around it. And, and neither should we, frankly. But having this opportunity to watch the second Women's Paris-Roubaix in a few weeks and the first Tour de France Femme 
will be phenomenal. And I'm really proud to be a part of a broadcast platform through Discovery and Eurosport and GCN that, that shows more women's racing than anyone else, more women's racing than ever before, because these things will make a difference. And if it's just making a difference, to show little girls that they can do what the boys do, that they can fall down and get back up again, get dirty and get grimy and get gritty and then still look amazing on the podium, then that in itself is enough. Because even when as I was growing up, that's part of the reason I love track and field because I got to see women competing on the same level as men. And I didn't realize that at the time, but that's why I loved it. And now we get to show that through cycling and we will keep being able to do that more and more through cycling and it really matters in all sports in all sports and do you think we need to package women's sport and women's cycling differently to men's or is it just about giving it equal airtime i don't think we need to package it differently at all actually unless we're packaging the men's cycling differently which i think we could i think we could do it all better i i think there is a danger in uh, women's cycling in particular following the same format as the men's racing because if you were to invent cycling as a as a sport as an elite sport now in 2022 you would never decide that three grand tours three weeks of racing 21 stages in a row was a good idea and you would never have this jumbled confused calendar that we have in men's racing and women's teams don't yet have the the numbers and the depth to be able to accommodate all of that women's racing could do with being different i think the coverage though has to be the same because once you start making it different it's seen to be different because it's not as good or because it needs X, Y, or Z. But if you give it the same platform, we're saying, yeah, but it's just as good. I have so much I could talk to you about, but one of the areas I am fascinated to explore with you is the fact that you stopped drinking four years ago. I also quit last June, so almost a year now, and it's been the most extraordinary, positive, joyful experience. So why did you stop? <sighs> Uh, congratulations, first of all. I'm delighted you. that you find it so <laughs> positive. It's amazing. I actually stopped now, uh, it's longer than that, uh, six and a half years ago, I think it is now. Oh, wow. Okay. No, I think so. I think it is. Let me think. Something like that, anyway. Um, I stopped because I drank too much for a start. And that was fun for a long time, you know. And I lived in central London I lived in Notting Hill and I had a carefree existence and I had no kids and I had lots of people to go out and have fun with and when it stops being fun you don't realize you know and you keep trying to get the fun back again and you think that that alcohol was your doorway into the fun so if you keep if you keep opening that door and going through that door the fun will come back and you don't realize that actually that is becoming the block to having fun um, so I drank too much. And uh, when my daughter came along, it was essentially then impossible to be every version of myself that I wanted to be. I wanted to still be the fun one, you know, and the party girl. But I couldn't do that and be a good mum and work as hard as I want to work. And so something had to go. And that's a really sanitized version really of what it was it was it was a lot more brutal than that and and I had to face up to a lot of home truths that were very difficult but I decided that I didn't want my life to be that and I didn't want to um suffer hangovers with a young child because it's really hard and I thought I'm losing out in time with her I'm not gaining time through having fun I'm just having alcohol and then losing out with her so I took the very difficult decision. It was difficult because I'd actually wanted to stop drinking for a long time before I did. And I almost always knew I would stop because I thought I can't sustain this. Um, and in the times that it wasn't fun, I knew it would have to end. And that's what I did. And I just decided that's it. I just can't drink. And I, I actually, I was going to say I can never drink again. That wasn't the thinking. It was I have to stop now and then I'll see. I'll see what tomorrow is and I'll see what the, what tomorrow's tomorrow is. And I was going on a girl's holiday to Ibiza four days after I stopped drinking. And my husband was like, mm, do you want to reconsider the girl's Ibiza trip? But I thought, well, no, because if I, if I stop drinking, I don't want to stop living. The point is I need to stop drinking to live properly again. And going to these girls to Ibiza will be awesome fun. And I want to do that. And so I did. And I'm really glad I did because we had the most amazing time. 
And it was a wonderful place to disconnect from real life as well and just concentrate on not drinking and why I wasn't drinking. And so, yeah, it was just a, it was just a slow process of reforming habits. That's what was really hard. There's so much connected to alcohol, especially in our society. There is the fact that you walk into a supermarket and there is alcohol everywhere. So you've got to break the habit of just picking up a bottle of wine to have with your dinner. Then there is the habit that you form of celebrating with a glass of wine, commiserating with a glass of wine, congratulating yourself for getting through another day with a glass of wine and working out how you do all of that without alcohol, but also then realizing what a load of rubbish all of that is. <laughs> but congratulating yourself with a glass of wine, but giving yourself a sore head is congratulations, come on. And then there's the network of friends, you know. Um, I lost quite a lot of friends through my not drinking. I felt I felt the responsibility to be the life and soul of the party. I felt the responsibility always to, to be the one to get things going and to make sure everyone was having fun. And I thought, I can't do that without alcohol. But the friends that stuck around are so, so, so dear to me. And I want to mention one of them just because he died this week. And I, and I really just want to say his name out loud because um, the room. There aren't many people like him. And so Richard Muir, my friend, was one of the friends who um, wouldn't have realized he made it easier because he kept dancing with me and he kept going out with me and he kept having fun. And he never once asked me why I felt the need to stop drinking. He just accepted it because he knew it was best for me. And he didn't ever. Lots of friends, if you try to stop drinking, will project yourself on themselves onto you and their issues with alcohol onto you. And they will be afraid that you walking away from alcohol is leaving them alone with it. Um, and he just never did that. You know, he never, he never tried to like drag me along into the booze party. He just kept me at the party. And that was really, really important. I, I thanked him for a lot in his life. And I didn't, I didn't ever think to thank him for that because he was always going to be my friend and he was always going to be there. And now he's not, but I'm so incredibly grateful to him and another, another good friends who helped you through these things. And my life is so, 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 so much better without alcohol. And it makes me sad to look back and think of all the years that I did drink, really, and that I didn't embrace this fullness of life earlier. But it's also OK because you have to learn your lessons and you have to do it your way. But one of the joys of stopping drinking and having to form these new habits is that every new habit that you make, to replace the alcohol is something that's good for you, which is wonderful. So I started meditation and I started yoga and I paddleboard and I go cold water swimming and I still need kicks. You know, I still need that intensity of feeling alive, but I do it in a way that opens my lungs and my heart and my soul and my eyes to the world. And that's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And it's not something that everybody needs to do, but it's something that I needed to do. And I'm very grateful that I did. Fantastic. I'm nodding vigorously here. It's a podcast, but I yeah, completely uh, agree with so much of uh, so many of your thoughts there. I love the realism in your Instagram bio where you say you're a sports broadcaster, podcaster, columnist and writer, lover of cycling, Olympics, athletics and my two kids, balls may drop. And I'm I'm always wary of asking women about bringing up children as it's not something we would necessarily ask men in the same position, but your bio does also say you're a full-time mum. So how have you balanced life, especially when you're, you're traveling so much for those big events? Um, it's, I was going to say it's a hard question because sometimes I feel like I don't balance it very well and often I don't. But but principally how I do it is with incredible support from my husband, firstly, who um understands entirely what my work means to me and and what my mission is <laughs> in life but also from in particular our two mothers and we have a, a babysitter who also is a massive massive help so I, I don't do it by myself I don't at all and I couldn't do it by myself but it's really difficult and, and I sometimes feel guilty about projecting an image of the possibility of doing it. And I also don't want it to sound like it's impossible because obviously you can, but sometimes when it's really hard and people say, oh, it's wonderful that you do this and I'm really glad that you show that you can do it. And I want to reply, don't believe it. <laughs> don't believe it because there's a reason most people do it because it's really bloody hard and, and I'm maybe doing the wrong thing. So don't, 
take my example as the way to do it. You've spoken and written very publicly about mental health, be that postnatal depression and, and anxiety. And even in 2022, it does take some courage to be so open. Was that a difficult decision? I think having spoken to you today, I can I can understand the why, but I wonder how, how people have reacted to that honesty and, and openness. I've had such an overwhelming reaction to starting to post a little bit more about anxiety and and it's why I keep doing it really and I don't I I also don't want to be just that you know so I have to be careful that I'm, that I'm also posting things that I celebrate and things that I love but I I do think it's important to post about anxiety and um and my postnatal depression as it was because depression is horrific and anybody who ever goes through it it is so suffocating and when I was going through it that's all you can think about it is yourself and your pain and um the darkness and the fact that there is simply no way out there is no way out you're you're in a straight jacket and you're bashing into walls and there's, there's no door there's no window there's nothing and then when I came through it I forgot that other people would maybe see the image that I like to project as being all of me I don't I don't mean that to sound sort of egotistical or self-focused I mean more that I like to be a happy person and I and I forget that people don't realize that your happiness isn't inevitable and it's it's not without its hard work so whenever I whenever I posted the first time about suffering postnatal depression I remember a colleague at work getting in touch and saying you're the last person I would have expected to suffer postnatal depression and that really shocked me I thought who do you expect to suffer from postnatal depression then you know because me being a happy person and a joyful person has got nothing to do with suffering depression. And so that was a little glimmer of it, but I've sort of kept it not private, um, just not thought it was something that needed to be shared. But I realized when I started to post a little bit about anxiety, how much it was connecting with people and how some of the messages that I get from people are absolutely heartbreaking that I don't even know where to start. And it made me realize that it is also important to show that even though my job involves me being on television, being on television as a woman means getting your hair and makeup done. And I love to wear smart clothes and look a certain part. And I think it's really important to show that that, that doesn't mean that for anybody watching at home, they're looking at someone whose life is perfect. You can look at anybody and have no idea what's going on with them so if you're suffering know that you're not alone know that you're not the only one know that not everyone else has this perfect existence and you're the only one who's going mad you know um and so I find that just really important to share with other people that that we're we're not on it together we're not in it together because everybody's is so entirely different but if we're not connecting with each other and and helping and reaching out then what is the point I love the the piece you mentioned around that kind of connecting and people reaching out to you because I I shared a couple of posts about stopping drinking quite I, put, I shared something on LinkedIn actually which wasn't a normal place to share stuff but I had so many direct messages from people who were thinking about stopping mm. and wanted to you know it's like oh everything came out and that, that was kind of lovely to be able to as you say be very public and open about it things aren't always as they appear on the on mm. the surface are they for people too you've clearly achieved so much in, in so many different ways across life so just finally I wonder in terms of future ambitions a huge summer ahead and, and so much in terms of uh, sport and cycling but what, what are your kind of ambitions for the future I have future ambitions and I'm glad I do actually now see because I didn't for a while I felt like whenever I got my dream job I thought well, what next I've done it like I've done what I wanted to do but thankfully I'm incredibly restless and I, and I do now have ambitions that I want to achieve and and one of them is uh, a book that I'm hoping to write uh, that that will matter to me a lot and um, there's a there's a documentary series that I would really love to get off the ground that I'm working very hard on and if that happens it will be something that's so personal and meaningful to me and um, hopefully will connect with a lot of people but I think my ambitions really are those with meaning now you know because I wanted to to achieve what I've achieved so far for me and that's wonderful and and you have to do it for you but then now I want to use the tiny platform that I have to reach out and to do things not necessarily for other people but with other people well yeah for other people I guess and with other people and and I want to strengthen connections through writing and through um 
more substantial broadcast and podcasting is a massive part of that. We're sharing stories that I feel really matter. And we've had a few conversations for it so far, which have been, they've just blown me over. And I think as well, you know, so see, and I'm going off on a tangent here, but I find that the more honest and vulnerable you are with people, the more they give you that in return. And that's been an absolute privilege of the last couple of years. Being a bit more open with people has meant I've gotten that back again. And so some of the stories that I've been able to share or we will be able to share on our podcast that I'm doing with Greg Rutherford, uh, we've had some beautiful conversations that, that hopefully will really matter to people and strike a chord with people. And that's really, really, really deeply satisfying. Wow, what a woman. I absolutely loved talking to Orla and I wish her well for future projects. If you'd like to hear from other incredible female trailblazers in the sport, head to fearlesswomen.co.uk where you'll find details of all of my guests from this and the previous series. And if you'd like to hear from other women working as sports broadcasters, you'll find episodes where I talk in depth with Claire Balding, Laura Woods, Gabby Logan, Jessica Crichton, Ebony Main for Brent and Kelly Cates, along with many sports pundits such as Denise Lewis, Enia Luco, Kelly Smith and Maggie Alfonsi. As well as listening to all the podcasts on the website, you can also find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a free network for all women working in sport. You can sign up for Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter, which highlights the developments in global sport. And there's also more about my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. Thanks once again to Sport England for backing the game changers through the National Lottery and to Sam Walker, who does such a great job as our executive producer, along with Rory Ouskery on sound production. Finally, thank you to my brilliant colleague, Kate Hannon, who does so much to support the podcast at Fearless Women. I don't often ask, but if you'd like to give The Game Changers a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, that would be great as it really helps get these stories out to more people. Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook at Sue Anstis. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport.